All right, I'm going to do a recap. We were looking at the book of Ezekiel, and we're realizing that the cherubim and all the things that Ezekiel saw, they were really representing the temple and especially the Holy of Holies, because that's where the cherubim are, that's where the coals are. Now, I've been learning a little bit more. I think I have to, once again, clarify some things I said in the past. <laughs> so last time around, I pretty well interchanged the word tabernacle and temple. But the tabernacle, as far as I can tell, only had two cherubim. Ezekiel is looking at four cherubim. So I think he's referring to the Temple of Solomon. Let's talk about Ezekiel. He saw the Lord with the cherubim. That's the glory of the Lord. The part that sometimes we miss, he sees a throne and he sees God sitting on the throne. And so that again is the majesty of God, the incredible glory of God. That's what all that light is about. And the more I study the more I realize that everything that these cherubim are made of is to be light or reflection of light. Everything about them. That's what we read in Ezekiel chapter 1. And then I was talking about the idea that all the prophets saw the Lord. In fact, I've been doing a little bit more research, and we can now even include Jeremiah. Because remember, Mark, we were talking about Jeremiah, and the Lord said to him, what do you see? And he saw the rod of the almond tree, which is a symbol of to watch over. That rod represents the concept in the Hebrew language, to watch over. So that's where you get the shepherd's staff from. It's the idea of the shepherd watches over the flock. But God said to Jeremiah, I will watch over my word. Now, think about this. When we get into the temple and we get into the Holy of Holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant. That's where that almond rod is. So even Jeremiah is seeing, can I call it components? of the Holy of Holies, Jeremiah is seeing the rod of the almond tree, which is also in the Ark of the Covenant. And God is saying to Jeremiah, I will watch over my word to perform it. Connects that with the rest of the prophets. Do you see that? Now, I think it's important that we are seeing that Ezekiel is seeing the same thing as all the other prophets, including John in the book of Revelation. And I'll tell you why. Because the church, especially in the last, I would say, more than 200 years, okay? When the Schofield Bible came out, there was a great interest in end times. But here's the problem. All the people that said that they were studying prophecy weren't actually studying prophecy. They were carnalizing pretty well everything they saw. When the Schofield Bible came out, there's this concept that came with it. There was supposed to be this time that the church would call the rapture. That all comes out of carnal teaching about the prophets. The church wants to escape judgment, but the church will not escape judgment. No. no one is. Here's the other problem. Whenever I listen to anyone teaching prophecy, they call it teaching prophecy, but they're not actually teaching prophecy. What they're doing is they're teaching their carnal interpretation of the things that the prophets saw. Instead of realizing that the prophets, Ezekiel, Isaiah, John, Zechariah, and I could go on and on, they saw the Lord, and then they had to go and challenge the people of God, because the people of God had 
begun worshiping all kinds of concepts of God. So in that sense, they were breaking the first commandment. Breaking covenant, Mm -hmm. in other words. God made a covenant. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt. You will have no other gods before me. I'm the one that delivered you. The same applies to the modern church today. Everybody thinks we're just fine. You're actually prophesying the same thing that the children of Israel heard from the false prophets. Mm -hmm. Everything is fine. When the real prophets of God would say, listen, you've broken covenant with God. He made promises to protect you as long as you were in covenant with him. Mm -hmm. But since you have broken the covenant... Well, the enemy is coming in, and they're going to defeat you on all fronts. So you'll see all kinds of activity in the Old Testament where the Egyptians would come in, the same ones that said, you know, the the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt. And so the Egyptians would come, take some people captive, and take over. Take the gold and the silver and all the things of value. Why? Because God had said it would happen in the covenant. If you break the covenant, this is what's going to happen. So that's what happened. We're not talking about one or two enemies. It seemed like all the enemies that came against them We're now defeating them, even the ones that they had been defeating before. Like you remember the Moabites and the Ammonites. They had no problem with the Moabites and Ammonites because they were in covenant with God. But when they broke covenant, now the Ammonites, the Moabites, Mount Seir, all their neighbors, and then the larger nations from further away, Egypt, Babylon, the Assyrians, they all came in and they had no problem. Why? Because the protection of God was cast away. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So today, the reason the church thinks it's going to be rescued before judgment is because of carnal interpretation of the book of Ezekiel, the book of Revelation, They cannot see that God is actually holding us accountable to what we've taught the flock about the plan of God. The plan of God is absolutely, clearly unfolded in Scripture. There is coming judgment. Judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. You're not going to escape it. You can hold on to this teaching of rapture all you want. You're not going to escape judgment. And you leaders that have told the people of God that God's nature is different than what he has presented in Scripture, like when you say God is sovereign, he controls your life every day, every moment, everything that happens in your day, God's controlling it. In fact, God is in control of all evil. You will be judged because you are saying things about God that are not true, they're not found in Scripture, and they're definitely not found in covenant. I've said this before. I want ministers and preachers to study the word covenant. You know how to do a word search. All you have to do is open up your Bible, do a word search, and find the word covenant, and then study that word every place it's mentioned. You will soon discover that God is a covenant-keeping God. When you have an agreement, it's not about control. It is about choices, about working together. I saw this when I went to Joshua. They, they listened to the word of the Lord. They listened to Joshua. And then he said, go in, take the spoils, and 
mint, the gold, the silver, the uh, and, and, and all their all their uh, what do you call them uh, shekels and whatever else. Right. And he said, and just that, and burn everything down, get yep. rid of it. Yep. And then there were some of the leaders of the tribes that took spoil for themselves and hid it in their tents underneath, buried it. And uh, the Lord said, hey, whoa, no, 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 no. I told you not to do that. And so uh, Joshua said, okay, who did this? Found out who did it, brought him to him, plus his family. He killed all his family, all the people, all the all his livestock, everything. Because they agreed that they wouldn't do that. They agreed. Yeah. Plus, I'll show you something else. With that family or that man or that group of people yeah. Yeah. taking the spoils when God said not to, yeah. what they're really declaring is, I'm going to take care of myself yeah. because I don't believe that God is going to keep his word. Yeah. That's why they had to be killed. Yeah. Because you can't have that mm -hmm. among the people of God. Yeah. You can't have that attitude that I have to watch out for myself because I don't really trust God. Because yeah. the attitude will spread. Yeah. The attitude will spread. Leaven the lump. Yeah, it's infectious. Yeah. Leaven the whole lump. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't that work well in, in our society today, where the whole society is about what's good for? Uh, we, we haven't got a generation that's even looked to God aside from when they need something and they're in a in a terrible state. That's the only time when we really look to God. Well, here's the problem, Mike. Those people that get in trouble, that's when they call on God. But here's the problem: the preachers and teachers and pastors have told them that God works with evil and controls their lives. Now, you're going to come to God and ask for help now without repenting of what you've said about God? No, he's not going to respond to that. I was thinking a lot about this. I told you three weeks ago now that I meditate a lot about repentance. Now, Jesus... At his time, when he's about 30 years old, that's when he started his ministry. Now, John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I've got to make this connection for you, because what we're doing in these studies is we're connecting all the prophets. And I believe that we will continue to do this because I'm seeing more and more and more connections. Sometimes we read a prophet and we think, oh, that's interesting, that's in that book. No, I'm finding that what the prophets saw is found in all the other prophetic books. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. This is what they were waiting for. Jesus was supposed to come. The Messiah was to come. Now, there was two images of the Messiah in the Old Testament, and they had trouble with it. Because on one hand, you have the suffering Messiah, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, you have the victorious Messiah. They couldn't put this together. When John would say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they're thinking, okay, the Messiah is coming, and they're thinking carnally. They're thinking he's going to be a physical king with a physical Israel on the physical earth. But they don't realize that when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of it. And the reason now that we have to go back and go through some of these prophetic books is because these prophetic books have been interpreted through carnal eyes. They are still, to this day, the church is saying, Jesus came as the suffering Messiah, but we didn't see the victorious Messiah. That's because you can't see. That doesn't mean he didn't come and fulfill the scriptures. 
He was victorious. But you're looking for a different kind of victory. He did defeat the flesh and the devil, which, by the way, I cannot any longer say the devil without saying man, mm -hmm. because they are one in the same. They work together. You'll see that today. What did Jesus say to the Pharisees? You are of your father. The devil. You are, you are of your father, the devil. And the gear converts twice to the hell as you are. Yes. You cannot say the devil without including man. That's another separation the church has done. They'll say the devil has power on his own to do this and that and hurt people and, and wreck your car and your washing machine and all this. No, he has absolutely no power in the physical realm whatsoever. He has to, oh, I'm going to use this word just to make people mad. The devil also has to make covenant with man. With man. He cannot accomplish what he wants done without man. That's why he needed Adam to bring forth his plan. Right. To rebel against God. Yes. yes. The devil couldn't make him rebel or do anything evil to him. All he could do was tempt him yeah. to say, has God said is the word of God enough? And they're saying it today. They're saying it today. They are saying the suffering Messiah came, but the victorious Messiah did not yet. See how messed up the church is? No, the suffering Messiah and the victorious Messiah are one and the same at the same time. Mm -hmm. What Jesus did on the cross destroyed the flesh and birthed the church. Which, by the way, it's not a new thing. <laughs> I am so frustrated by the teaching of men. The church is messed up because they're thinking the physical victorious Messiah has to come yet because he didn't do it when he came the first time. No, it's just because you can't see the victory that Jesus brought us to defeat the devil and all those that oppose God. So we'll go back to John the Baptist. Repent. Now, remember, John the Baptist was the fulfillment of Elijah. Jesus said that. Yeah. Elijah came. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Think about what Elijah did. The thing is, because we're so carnal, we can't look at John the Baptist and make the connection because we think that John the Baptist and Elijah did different things. Nope. They did exactly the same thing, calling the people back from worshiping a false concept of God. Because one was coming, the Messiah, that represented the true concept of God. That's why the church not only divides the Messiah idea, so they'll say, okay, the church has to be raptured, taken out of the way so the Messiah can come. No, you messed it up from the beginning. The Messiah came and fulfilled all Scripture. All Scripture! They keep saying, and I've listened this week to a lot of teachers. Oh, I've been listening to a lot of Hal Lindsey. That fellow's messed up. Here's the problem. He can quote a ton of Scriptures, but his conclusions are wrong. Because he can't see that Jesus fulfilled all scripture. He uses words like, 
parenthesis. He will say that the scriptures were fulfilled up to a certain point, and because he can't see that scripture fulfilled, he'll say, this time from when Jesus was raised from the dead until now, he puts a parenthesis. It's like he says, prophecy was put on hold. You guys are laughing because you haven't had this teaching. But I'm telling you, 99% of the evangelical church has this mentality. They've been taught this. Okay, all this talk about the temple, we're looking at the temple. The prophets are looking at the temple. Even at times when the temple was destroyed, they were looking at the temple. A vision of the temple. You're thinking, well, how can they see the temple in a vision if the temple is lying in ruins? Because God has a plan. And that plan was Christ. So people keep talking about, well, we have to rebuild the temple so Jesus can come back. No. When Jesus came, he established the temple, the true temple. Yeah. Now, this is where you're going to get a whole bunch of arguments. People will throw this at you. You'll say, we are Israel. And Jesus has established his true temple. It's a spiritual house. Mm -hmm made up of spiritual people. Yeah. They'll come back at you and you'll say, no, there's two Israels. The physical Israel and the spiritual Israel. They've never understood the concept that God all the way through Scripture said there is a true Israel and a false Israel. All you have to do is read all the prophets and you'll see that. The book of Hosea. God is calling Hosea to marry a harlot so that Hosea knows exactly what it's like, how God felt about having a relationship with this people who were unfaithful. And then he told this statement through Hosea. All these people that think they are the people of God, they are no longer the people of God. But I will have a people. God will have his people. And those prophecies, here's the problem. They say that prophecy is like only the future. It's a constant mistake that they make. It is not future. It is now. It was now when Hosea spoke it. It's true today, now. And it'll be true tomorrow now. This is the thing you don't understand about the Word of God. You're looking for physical proof of these prophecies coming to pass. It is not seen in the physical. It is seen in the spiritual. Everything that God has said is eternal. It is ever true. Well, that's that's exactly what's happening today. They are they are they've taken and they've made God into a different image. Right. Brought and revealed through Christ. Well, I tell you, I can say this boldly now, because I have support. But I'm telling you, these thoughts scare me because the church thinks it's doing just fine. Mm -hmm. But they have departed from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and followed a God of this world. Mm -hmm. They're saying God is in control of the world. Yeah. Do you see that? Yeah. It is not the God of our Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. because Jesus could care less about the world around him. Mm -hmm. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. It's the kingdom of heaven. It is not the kingdom of this world. So all your beliefs about the Messiah having to come back and be a Messiah on the earth? Listen, if Jesus could discern when the crowds were going to grab him and put a crown on him to make him king, 
and he walked away, it's because he never intended to be a king on this earth. Meanwhile, the church is expecting him to show up so we can do it again. Try it one more time. Let's put a crown on him and make him king of the earth. Okay, the church keeps saying Jesus is coming to judge the world. He was already judged. The world? You said it, Mike. The world is already judged by their choices. Okay? Jesus is coming to judge the church. That's why this foundation that we keep talking about in almost every video, the foundation has to be Jesus. You can't have an image of God and then try to fit your Jesus in. It has to start and end with Christ as the true image of God. So you're following this idea. The world does not need to be judged because it's judged already. What Jesus is coming to do is judge the church. There's all kinds of scriptures then that we have to bring out. Like judgment begins in the house of the Lord. The bride has garments that need to be cleansed. Why do the garments of the bride need to be cleansed? Because they're full of spots and wrinkles and blemishes. The garments are defiled. And those scriptures that I dealt with when I brought this up before, I was reading out of my little booklet that I wrote. I knew this 30 years ago. and never had the guts. The garments of the bride are tarnished. The spots and wrinkles are teachers, false teachers, that have to be cleansed from the garments of the bride. As long as the church is thinking, we're fine, then there's not going to be any repentance. There's not going to be any cleansing. Let's define repentance. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what's the first thing we think about because of the teaching of the church? We think, repent all the sins. The things you've done wrong. All the things that man says that we've done wrong or do wrong. Okay? That's the first thing we think about. But think of John the Baptist representing Elijah. What was the sin that Elijah challenged? Going after false gods. Yes. He said, you're caught between two opinions, either serve God or serve Baal. Make your choice. And they stood there not knowing how or who he's talking about because they had amalgamated the concept of God with the concept of Baal. And they couldn't tell the difference. So what Elijah had to do was show them the difference. Now think about this, the prophets of Baal and Elijah had exactly the same sacrifice, exactly the same. What they needed to know is that Baal is nothing. So it is a waste of time to sacrifice You could sacrifice all day if you want. Think of what man wants us to do. Sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. What good is it if we have a wrong concept of God? Oh, by the way, I found out they had already agreed to it before Moses went up on the mountain to get the tablets of the testimony. They had already said several times in the book of Exodus... They had said, yes, we will keep this covenant. Then when Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days, they said, it's taking too long. 40 days. And they made a molten calf, which, listen, that is what's supposed to be sacrificed on the altar, is the calf. Not worshipped. Not worshipped.